All right, I have a, I have a confession to make. Um, the whole idea of doing monthly baptisms was my idea to begin with, and I remember getting very excited about it, the possibilities and see what God was going to do. Uh, and then after a couple of months of it and God was moving and hundreds of people were being baptized, I thought, wow, are we going to be able to sustain this? I mean, is this really? And I'm telling you, month after month after month, there are lives changing right in front of us as we watch these baptisms, and we need to celebrate what God is doing in people's lives. We need to do that. Yeah. So if it's okay with you, we're going to keep doing it. Is that all right? We keep doing this monthly, and we celebrate what God's doing. Okay. I, there were a couple times I said to Gerald, I said, I want to know that story. I want to know that story. You know, from the kids to the adults, it's amazing. Uh, well, hi. Good morning, everybody. Kids, uh, I, we may not have met kids, so I know this is our second Worship Together weekend, so I should probably introduce myself to you if you're going to be here regularly on a monthly basis. I'm Pastor Dave. I'm glad you could be with us, and uh, we're going to... I'm going to tell you a story in a few moments. I'm going to tell you kids that there are, there's a yucky part of it. Sorry. Uh, your, kids, your parents will explain it later. Uh, <laughs> but, <there's, laughs> but before we get to the story, uh, let's be generous. Ushers, can we, can we help people be generous this morning with our worship and with our giving as our ushers come and take our, uh, receive our uh, offerings and our tithes? And can I go off script here for a few seconds and tell you about what I'm excited about starting next week? Uh, I have been at this 38 years in ministry, and Grace, 25 years. We've been 20, this is our 25th anniversary. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I have never been more anticipating a sermon series starting next week than this one in all these years. The sermon series is actually going to be about a four-month sermon series called Days of Wind and Fire. We're going to be examining the presence of, the identity of, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm thrilled that we're going to start next week. It's going to be a very unusual sermon next week. It's going to be less sermon, more musings on my part. And I'm, I'm very excited about it. Um, and it will lead up to a, pin, a pinnacle, so to speak, on the 25th anniversary, which is the second weekend of September of this year, and we're all going to be together, all of our campuses, all our three campuses, together at uh, Banker's Life Fieldhouse in downtown Indianapolis. Thousands of us, we're going to celebrate. So mark that calendar. It's going to be exciting. And on that day, I'm preaching on Acts chapter 2 about what happened when everyone was all together in one place. So uh, we'll see what God's going to do. So that's what's coming up. In, in short term, that's, that's coming up in September and the sermon series starting next week. But I also want to invite you back here in a few days, Wednesday night. We have our prayer gathering. Uh, you're going to be here, right? Okay. Uh, our prayer gathering, here's what happens. We gather and then we... You guys are so sharp. You just take my breath away sometimes because you pick up what the prayer gathering is all about. We gather to pray, but we more than pray... We worship. It's kind of crazy worship. Uh, I understand it's going to be an acoustic set this Wednesday night, but Stephen and Vernon are leading it, and that, uh, that always spells good thanks. And it's going to be wonderful this Wednesday night, so you don't want to miss the prayer gathering. And is any, if anybody needs to be healed of something, you might want to come Wednesday night because we're going to pray for healing. I don't know what God wants to do, but I know that we are going to pray for healing. So I'd encourage you to be here Wednesday night, and we'll see what God wants to do. But that's, okay, that's the future. We need to finish up this series we're in right now. I need to finish this hero series, so here we go. Let's get into the message, and then I'll tell the story, kids, and it's coming, and it's yucky, but that's okay. Uh, you'll hear it in a few. All right. The world needs heroes. Does anybody agree with me on that? Okay, I think you do, which means that the world needs you. Because you have the capacity to be a hero. That's what we've been examining, ordinary heroes. Here's what it takes. Three weeks ago, when we started, we realized, here's what it takes. A seize-the-moment mentality. In other words, I know the need of the hour. I will react. We learned that through the be beauty queen Esther, who became the rescuer of Israel. Two weeks ago. 
We learned that if we're going to be heroes, we need to take off our masks. Amy helped us understand that we need to have a soul-bearing willingness to come clean with God and with others, and that gives us the capacity to be heroes in this world. Now, we learned that through King David, king of Israel. Last week, Barry helped us understand that if we're going to be heroes, we need to stop avoiding who we used to be and start becoming who we are. That is our new identity in Jesus Christ. And he helped us understand that through the story of Gideon, the reluctant judge of Israel. Here's, this is the bottom line. You can do this. We want you to know you can do this. And I'm not kidding. You can respond to the need of the hour with a gut level honesty coupled with a drive to live out your identity and boom, hero is born. That can be you. Side note, I've had enough conversations with people since we started this series and it's a little mini series, it's like a little four week series and yet people are, there's a buzz that people are saying, I feel like God is calling me to something new. I think some of these baptisms are indication that God's hand is on people's lives and calling them something new and I would say calling you to actually be heroes in this world, we need you. You can, the finger of God has been in some people's chests, I've, I've talked to you about it and the only reason why I bring this up is it's gonna happen again today. It is. Some of you are going to feel the squeeze of the Holy Spirit's hand on your shoulder in the next few moments. So just be aware and be ready for it. Some of you are going to feel the finger of God in your chest calling you to be different in this world and become a hero in this world. So I'm just telling you, be prepared. And at the end of the service, I'm going to pray for you. So all I ask you to do is just pay attention. Pay attention of the next few moments. Now, let's talk about this fourth guy, this fourth hero and I saved the oddest for last. This guy was weird. And his story is awkward and it's controversial. I will even go so far as to say this guy is an anti-hero. Do you know what that is? An anti-hero is a person who ha is a hero, but they don't have all the defining characteristics of a hero. They don't look like a hero, but they are a hero. That's this guy. For instance, uh, most hero stories are Rags to riches. They start from, the heroes start from obscurity and they become something. Uh, Esther started from obscurity. She became the rescuer of Israel. David started as this young shepherd. He becomes the king. Gideon is this guy just threshing wheat. And he becomes a, a judge over Israel. Um, this guy that we're going to look at today is not a rags to riches story. Unusually, he's a riches, he's a riches to rags story. He started off as somebody, but he dove to the bottom purposely. You, I'll, sh I'll explain that in a minute. Here's another typical thing of heroes, that eventually heroes are adored by the masses. Everyone loves the hero. That's what normally happens after they, this rag, rags to riches, and they become powerful, and then everyone loves them. This guy is different. He spent most of his tri time trying to offend everyone. I think by the time he, and eventually you're going to see, and this is the yucky part of the story, he ends, up get, he ends up dying because he's so offensive. But it's a good offensive. I mean, he's speaking on behalf of God because he's a prophet, but unusual man. And as odd as he was, as unconventional and eccentric and provocative as he was, there's something wonderful about him. And I would say that what we're going to see this morning, that what was wonderful about this guy is what the leaders of our world and you and I need if we're going to change our world. There were two characteristics of, from in this guy's life I don't want you to miss. They are these. He had a deep humility and he had an unflinching honesty. Now, if you don't like the word unflinching, what does that mean? You could actually say brutal honesty, okay? He was brutally honest, but he also was deeply humble. His name was John, his job was prophet, his nickname was the Baptist, John the Baptist. And here's what we're going to learn from his life this morning. Ordinary heroes don't care what others think about them. They're deeply humble and unflinchingly honest. So I'm going to give you an overview of his story, the four parts of his story real quick, and we'll look at two pieces of scripture. So you're going to need a Bible. Grab a Bible and turn to uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 14. The Bibles are on the seat in front of you. Page 723. Page 723. 
John the Baptist story is covered in all four Gospels. Now, kids, some of you know what the four Gospels are, so I'll get you started and you say it out loud with me. The four Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, if a person makes all four Gospels, that means they're kind of a big deal. All right? So he is kind of a big deal. Let's start with his dad. This is the, there are four parts of his story. Part one, part two, part three. Part one is his birth. Very unusual birth. He had famous parents. His dad's name was Zechariah. He was a priest. His mom also came from a priestly line. So they were important in their community. But they were sad in that they did not have any children. They were not, be, they were not able to bear children. And so even though they were important in their community, they lived their lives as pretty sad people until one day when Zechariah was doing his priestly work inside the temple, an angel appeared to him and not just any angel, not your garden variety angel, but Gabriel himself, one of the biggest, baddest angels that existed, appears to Zechariah and he says, I've got news for you. You are going to have a baby. Well, your wife's going to have a baby. You are going to have a child. And he's not going to just be any child. Let's read what he says. Luke chapter 1, verse 14. Gabriel says, he, your baby, will be a joy and delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Wow. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, I don't know that this is what happened, but I'm picturing that Gabriel drops this bomb on Zechariah and stands back and goes, Zechariah, bless his heart, I don't blame him. His response to Gabriel after hearing this is something like this. I, I, um, and Gabriel, it, again, I'm reading between the lines, seems to be a little offended at this. And Gabriel is sort of like, don't you know that I just talked to the Lord of the universe <laughs> and I'm bringing you this word about this baby and you're doubting this? So here's the deal, boom, you can't speak. <laughs> and he couldn't. Zechariah could not, he was struck dumb. He couldn't speak for nine months until the baby was born. And then just before the baby is born, they're trying to figure out what they're going to name this child. Now, Zechariah had told his wife somewhere along the line, probably wrote it in the sand or on something, we're going to name him John. But all the relatives and the friends are saying, no, you're going to name this child Zechariah because it's your firstborn child and everyone names their firstborn child after their father. And the mother, his mother's like, no, no, we're not, we're not going to name him that. And, Zechariah, and, and, and the people are saying, no, you're going to name him Zechariah. And she said, no, we're going to name him something. And people are going, no, Zechariah. And finally, right before the baby's born, right after the baby's born, Zechariah goes, we're name him John. <laughs> and that's the first words out of his mouth. And now he can speak again, which freaks everybody out. And we'll see the importance of this and how important it, he was to the people of Jerusalem and that area in just a few minutes. But that's part one of his story. Part two of his story uh, in, is his prophetic work. He grows up. He becomes powerful, he grows up, and if I could just summarize his whole, his whole message as a prophet, it was this, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. I'll describe what the word repent means in a few moments. And then people would come to him and he would say, repent for the kingdom is near, and they would repent, they would change their lives, and then he would baptize them, and he would baptize more and more and more, and there were lots and lots of baptisms, and that's why he's called John the... Baptist, right, because he baptized a lot of people, a lot of people who had repented. That's the second part of his story. The third part of his story was his connection with Jesus. Now, here's a fun fact. Kids, John the Baptist had the most famous cousin in history. Who was John the Baptist's cousin? 
Jesus was John the Baptist's cousin. That's a fun fact. I have that in the app. So by the way, there are, I have included fun facts. So take that, Barry. <laughs> yeah, Barry thinks he's the only one that could have fun facts. I had fun. It took me a lot longer to come up with them than him. I mean, he's like, <laughs> but next time you see Barry say, hey, your dad's fun facts are better than yours. Um, <laughs> So the third part of his story was his connection with Jesus. He actually baptizes Jesus, and it launches Jesus' um, ministry. The fourth part of his story is the yucky part of his story. We'll get to that in a minute. He actually dies as a result of being a very brutally honest prophet. Um, he gets up in the face of a key leader, and he's jailed and executed, and I'll tell you that story in a minute. All right. So his life, John the Baptist's life, was rather short. He lived only to about age 32, much like Jesus. And what makes him remarkable, well, I believe, is his underlying attitudes and characteristics that drove him. <clears throat> I told you <clears throat> there were two, deep humility and unflinching honesty. And ordinary heroes don't care what others think of them. This is what we're going to learn. They're deeply humble and unflinchingly honest. So... The rest of our time, we're going to look at those two characteristics as evidenced in John the Baptist's life. We'll start with deep humility. Let's start with this unusual truth about John is he had every reason to not be humble because he was born with a hero's resume. The minute he was born, this is, what, this is actually what um, Gabriel said about him. Many will rejoice because of his birth. He'll be great in the... This is a little baby. He'll be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Again, a little baby. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. That's quite a kid. And after he was born, everyone's all worked up. The neighbors were all filled with awe throughout the whole hill country of Judea. People were talking about him. I mean, people were talking about this kid. And then it says, the scripture says, and he grew and became strong in spirit. So even as a child and as a teenager, there was something special about this kid. And when he began his ministry as a 30-year-old, people flocked to him. He had a magnetism and said the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. And people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts, could this guy be the Christ? Even Jesus himself, his cousin, said this about John. I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Look, this is heady stuff. John was not a rags to riches story. He started off with riches, and I'm not talking about financial riches. He was powerful. He was strong. He had a great reputation. All of heaven had invested in him. And yet, he chose differently. This guy could have had a monumental swagger. He could have run for viceroy of the galaxy, and he would have won going away. He had that kind of resume. Yet, look at, would you turn to Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, that's page 682. 682. Look what he chose instead. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Now, here's the deal. This man who could have had a swagger and chosen to be powerful ran away from the crowds. When it says he went to the desert, it's not talking about a desert like sand and uh, uh, cacti, cactus. This is desert as in uninhabited places. He got away from the crowds. So he wanted to be alone. He didn't go for the crowds. He went for being alone. And he was living way off the grid before living off the grid was a thing. Not only that, he was frugal and he was ascetic. He must have read the book Essentialism. That's the only thing I can figure. He was a forager and a locavore before anyone talked about foraging and locavoring. He was humble. He lived 
a demonstrated life of deep personal humility. His was a riches to rags story, and this was no show. This was deep humility. And you can even hear the humility in his own voice when he meets his cousin Jesus and says this, he is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This is not a show, folks. He really had a deep personal humility. He said, Jesus must become greater. I must continue to become less. How refreshing is that? Can I stop for a second and just, can we, how refreshing is someone with that level of humility? And I'm telling you, there's something intriguing because in his deep humility, this guy was powerful. Now, in a minute, a few minutes, I'm gonna, when I wrap up this message, I wanna show you, I wanna show you the power of humility. I wanna show you how deep humility actually, ironically, becomes something powerful that is life-changing. And we'll get to that in a minute. Deep humility, but it's also coupled with this unflinching honesty. Not only do ordinary is no care what others think, they're deeply humble and they're brutally honest. Let's talk about his brutal honesty. He was unsparing. He was brutal. He was politically incorrect and it got himself killed. Here are just a few things he said. This is the summary of his message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now the word repent sounds like a religious word, but here's what it really means. Here's what he was saying. Change. Change. Change your mind change your attitude, change the direction of your life, change where you're going, change everything. You need to repent, all of you. But he wasn't just generalizing. He was real specific. I mean, talk about get in people's faces. He said to one group of people, the religious leaders said, he said, you children of snakes, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Did I say he was brutally honest? He was brutally honest. And he got real specific. At one point he said to everybody in the crowd, all right, raise your hand if you have two coats. Give away one of them, you don't need to. Raise your hand if you've got more to eat than you need. Give away half of it, you don't need all of it. And anybody in the crowd, a tax collector, I know people don't like you. I don't like you. Nobody likes you because of what you do. You're tax collectors, but you got to do your job. Here's all I'm saying. If you're going to be a tax collector, don't collect more than you're supposed to. Don't do that. Just stop it. Repent. And soldiers, we got any soldiers in the crowd. Raise your hand. Okay. Well, you know what? I know you guys don't like that you're not paid enough. I know you're, you're from... Italy and you're here in, in this place, you, you don't know why you're here and you're not getting paid enough. But let me tell you this, stop extorting people. I know you pull out your swords and you scare people and they give you money because you think you're not getting paid enough. Stop it. This was John the Baptist. I'm talking about brutal honesty. Now remember, it's coupled with this deep humility at the same time. So his brutal honesty got him in serious trouble. Here's the yucky part, kids. Uh, there was the leader of the land where he lived. His name was Herod Antipas, who had a brother who was the leader of a land right beside. His name was Philip or Herod Philip. Herod Antipas had a wife. Herod Philip had a wife. Herod Antipas didn't like his wife. He wanted his brother's wife. So he divorced his wife and he took his, I don't know how this worked. This is awful. He took his brother's wife and his brother's wife is now living with him. And John the Baptist heard about this and publicly called this guy out. I mean, called him out and said, this is wrong what you've done. You need to repent of this. Now he said it to the leader of the land and the leader of the land was not happy. So he said, arrest him. So John the Baptist was arrested. He was put in prison. Sometime later, Herod Antipas is having a party with his boys. Probably a lot of drinking involved, a lot, of, a lot going on, and they're all getting crazy. And Herod says, we need some entertainment. I know my stepdaughter 
is a really good dancer. We're going to bring her in. Herodias was his wife. Herodias' daughter, his stepdaughter, is brought into this crowd of guys, and she dances, and everybody loves it. And Herod's like, oh, that's wonderful. You can hear him in his drunken stupor looking at her saying, saying, that was wonderful. My stepdaughter was, why wasn't she wonderful, everybody? You know what, honey? I'll give you whatever you want, up to half my kingdom. She leaves. She goes to her mother, Herodias, and says, stepdad said he'll give me whatever I want. What should I ask from him? And Herodias who also did not like John the Baptist because she got called out in this too, said, I want you to go back and ask your stepdad for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. That's the gross part, kids, sorry. But that's exactly what happened. So the little girl goes to Herod and says, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. And he had already promised he would give her whatever she asked for. And so and John the Baptist was killed. And if you've ever heard the phrase, and his head was presented on a platter as a metaphor, now you know where it came from. It came from John the Baptist's life. His unflinching, brutal honesty cost him his life. It was a rather short life, but it was a powerful life. He cared nothing for the spotlight. He cared nothing for praise and adoration. He was deeply humble and brutally honest and he changed the world. He changed the world. He was a hero. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, a great man is always willing to be little. Always willing to be little. There is power in humility. The rest of our time, I want to show you, Just a, I only have a few minutes left. I want to show you why humility is so powerful and how it can change things. So I want you to imagine that I have a ladder here. If I had a thought about this, I would actually have a ladder. And it's got four rungs, one, two, three, four. And what I want to show you is the very top rung where we want to climb is we're going to say is influence. Okay, that's the top rung of the ladder, influence. Influence, when you have influence, you have power. Now, there are a lot of ways that we have power over one another. There's a lot of ways that we can have influence over one another. I mean, to get really ridiculous about it, if I pulled out a gun and I told you to do something, I think you would do it, right? Okay, that's illegitimate use of power. Another way that we could use power is to use our position or our title. Do this. And that person has position or title. That's an illegitimate use of power. Um, I could, here's another illegitimate use of power. If I could get really angry and get up in your face and say, you need to do that, you would probably do it because it would be a little bit scary. That's an illegitimate use of power and influence. But there is a legitimate use of influence and power and it comes from that second rung down, that spiritual authority. Spiritual authority. Now, what is spiritual authority? Spiritual authority is something that's hard to put your finger on, but you know it when you're experiencing it. Spiritual authority is what somebody has in your life. And you might even, right now, you're actually thinking of somebody that has spiritual authority. It might be a mom or a dad or a friend or an uncle, or it might be a teacher, it might be a coach. They have this spiritual authority that actually when they say something to you, you have no choice but to respond because you trust them and you believe in them. They have influence in your life, top rung, because they have spiritual authority. You can have that too, by the way. But if, if you want spiritual authority, then it's this rung below it that's important. You have to develop character. Character. That's where spiritual authority comes from. Now, let me talk about character. It is honesty, selflessness, truthfulness, patience, long-suffering, faithfulness, a strong character... The people that have those characteristics are the people that have spiritual authority and then ultimately influence. So, where do you get character? This is the key. It's that bottom rung, and it's what we've been talking about all morning, and it comes from humility. Humility breeds character, breeds spiritual authority, breeds influence. Let's talk about humility a little bit. There are two ways that a person becomes humble. 
One is you can choose. This is John the Baptist. I think he chose humility. He chose to live a selfless life. He chose to live a life that did not accept or embrace everything he could have been. He lived humbly. You can choose it. And some of you need to seriously consider choosing humility. But there's another way that we can develop humility, and that's, did you see the little word I had before, uh, beside it, brokenness? Because sometimes humility comes to us through circumstances. Brokenness, pain, struggle, loss. Now watch this, watch this. If you are broken, pain, struggle, loss, for whatever reason, pain, um, it does not necessarily make you humble. Because watch this. When you experience pain, you have two choices. Watch my hand. You can do this. And this is, I don't like this. I'm not going to let you into my life. Uh, I'm angry because this pain and this brokenness and the struggle in my life. You basically close and you close your fist. You pull, it, you pull yourself close by. No one's, you're not literally doing with your, your fist, but I'm talking about inside you have a closed fist because you're pain. You will not develop humility that way. Now watch this. You will develop humility through your brokenness if you do this. Watch. If your palms up and you let God do what he wants to do in your life through your brokenness and in your pain and in your suffering, if you release your fists and you go open palm, then guess what happens? You become humble. You become soft. You become tender. But it doesn't make it, what it does is that tenderness and that palms up in the middle of your brokenness breeds character, and that character breeds spiritual authority. And eventually, shocking to say, believe, to know this, but even in your brokenness, you can be a powerful person. Do you see how that works? Can't do this. Have to be this. It is time for some of you to release it. You're so angry because of your pain. You're so frustrated because of your brokenness. You're so ticked off because of your station in life. And it's time for you to release that fist, open up your palm to God, become a, a person of humility that will eventually make you into a hero. See, right now, all over this room, God is doing an amazing thing. He is speaking to you and he's got his hand on your shoulder. He is putting his finger in your chest and saying, this is what you've needed. Listen carefully. What I'm going to do right now is pray for you that you will hear the voice of the Holy Spirit calling you to this so that you can change your world as a hero. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. I want you to pay very careful attention because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Listen, listen. Holy Spirit, come now. Arise from within us, those of us who are followers of Christ. Descend upon us. Cover us with your presence. Be the wind and fire that blows through our lives to release us from the pain and the brokenness of our lives, to accept with humility who we are, and then develop the character and eventually the spiritual authority that will change our world. Holy Spirit, help us to hear your voice and make us brave. Make us brave as we move into our world with humility. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.